I'm Carson Block, and I'm here today for a very special short story with Michael Woodford. Michael is not a short seller, and he's not a professional investor. He's super interesting because he's a Brit who went on to lead one of Japan's largest companies, Olympus. And then right after he got named CEO, he discovered that there was a years-long uh, multi-billion dollar accounting fraud, and he blew the whistle on it. Michael, I, I'm really excited for you to tell your story to our viewers. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. So what is your background, Michael? How did you get to Olympus and ultimately to be CEO? No, it wasn't the, the classic Ivy League business school route at all. I was brought up uh, in a, a, a small city called Litchfield in the, in the Midlands in, the, in, in England near Birmingham. And uh, my father was a, a lecturer at university, middle-class boy. But when I was seven, my mother decided to leave my dad and went back to Liverpool. Uh, and that was working class Liverpool, uh, uh, a street as we call it, um, but uh, no bathroom, no indoor toilet. I was a snooty little uh, Lord Toffee face and was quickly in the first few days knocked off my bike as I came to realize that working class Liverpool was very different to middle class Litchfield. I went to school, um, I adapted, uh, I grew to have a great love and affection for Liverpool, including its football team, dare I say. But uh, I wasn't happy at home. Uh, my mother's second husband uh, and me didn't get on at all. And when I was, uh, just before my 17th birthday, I left and uh, left home, went to Liverpool, uh, London, where the streets I thought were all covered in gold. I got a job with Schweppes, Cadbury Schweppes, which you'll know through all those gin and tonics you drink, Carson. And I uh, was a salesman selling fizzy water, and uh, Schweppes was selling uh, the UK distributor for Pepsi. I realized I, I, I wasn't bad at selling, and uh, purely luck, I saw a newspaper advertisement uh, for salespeople selling Olympus endoscopes. And that sounded exciting. And I applied and somehow got the job. And uh, I went from the salesman and ended up as the CEO of the company. What it told me, it wasn't because I was so brilliant. It's, it's luck, opportunity, timing, as, as so many things in life are. First, backing up a little bit, coming from the background that you, you did, in some ways, in a lot of ways, you think that coming from working class Liverpool presents barriers to success. Um, you don't have access to networks, etc. But it can also instill a chip on one's shoulder. I mean, by the time you left for London, how do you think that that had set you up for future success? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think I could have gone two ways, but um, being comfortable middle class and then having to have secondhand school blazers, free school meals at lunchtime, laid down an insecurity, which is probably still with me to this day, although I, I think I'm more philosophical and less driven than I was uh, as a youngster of 17. But it, it gave me a, a, a drive to, to, to prove my worth, wanting to prove to my mother's second husband more than anyone that I wasn't worthless and that I... I could do things and, and that together with middle class to working class made me driven and uh, another word would be insecure and it's a powerful motivator. I, I often find driven people uh, become very self-consumed and aren't necessarily the nicest people um, but they can be very effective at, at, at running companies because of their, their relentless drive. Your story touches on so many fascinating topics. Japanese style stock fraud which is actually different from what I normally encounter. Real corporate intrigue, thinking you're an insider, but finding out that you're actually on the outside. Uh, Yakuza or Japanese organized crime in the markets. And on more normal level, being the rare foreigner running a Japanese, a major Japanese company, and just how open Japan really is to reforming corporate governance. I think at this point, we really should talk about what exactly the fraud was. So my understanding is that um, Olympus, like many other Japanese corporates in the 1980s, was speculating on stocks. There was a huge equity bubble. It burst. Massive losses. Didn't want to own up to that. And so had failed to recognize these losses for decades. And then ultimately decided to 
take the bath and, and come up with an excuse for not having the cash by massively overpaying for some assets. And there were intermediaries who were close confidants of Kikukawa who basically facilitated this overpayment in order to make the books balance. I mean, that's the essence of it. And there was all different sort of routings, you know, the Liechtenstein routing. But basically, the, the, the three, they, they, they bought three Mickey Mouse companies and paid a billion dollars. They paid, uh, can you believe this, you know, $700 million for consultancy fees to uh, uh, an unknown entity in the Cayman Islands, which also had an office of one man in Lexington Avenue, New York. And then that 1.7 million would come back in and be amortized. That was, you know, keeping it simple. At what point when you were at KeyMed, did you start thinking though, that you might actually, despite all of the problems inherent in Olympus and Japanese companies, that you might actually be able to run the whole thing or get pretty close? I, I never thought I, I would become the, the, the president because, you know, I wasn't a conformist, you know, you know some of the Japanese used to tell me, oh, you're, you're very difficult. Uh, which was a polite word for, you know, a huge pain in the, in the, in the back. I remember some of the meetings, um, global meetings, where you'd have the, the managements of the, the European, the British, and the American companies all meet in Tokyo. And I used to watch with horror as, and I have a huge respect for the entrepreneurship and, and, and the, the, the dynamo the United States is, but a lot of Japanese companies had, not just Olympus, uh, they were not good at managing Westerners. So you had Westerners realize that this is lifetime employment and you're never going to get fired. And that, that, that took off the edge, to say the very least. And one of the things I did when I became president was change a lot of the Western management. As you would see somebody in a room, you would know that they, you know, they, they, they just weren't up to it. But I used to end up in very heated discussions in Japan, often with my American counterparts. Uh, and what surprised me, I remember one year my American colleagues turned up and gave a presentation and they'd failed to deliver the targets. The senior Japanese person in the room stood up and said, well, thank you very much. These have been very difficult times. We really appreciate your efforts. Rather than hold the person to account, it was that type of soft you know, I mean, J Japanese don't generally, I certainly had confrontation with my board in, in, a, in a very extreme way, but generally they, they will choose to avoid, particularly with, with Westerners. So I, I, I was too, too difficult, too hot to handle, I thought. I mean, Carson, the issue of um, Japanese companies is, is something where, which shocked me. Um, and, but then spending so much time in Japan, I started to understand. They, they have an expression, the nail that stands up gets knocked down. And gosh, that is so true. It's not just a, a cliche. Conforming in a sort of toady-like manner to your boss, not challenging the hierarchy and not threatening the hierarchy. So if you are brilliant, you have a place and you you need to know your place in, in, in the food chain. That doesn't encourage, you know, the very best, the very brightest to, to, to succeed. And that was one of the, the frustrations I had when my time at Olympus came to such a sort of abrupt ending because it's not just women, women uh, but youth. Often the, 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 the lower down manager was so much better than the director. So it isn't a culture which encourages that. It, it's, it's almost like a bureaucracy which gets on the ruling class. And I'm generalizing. There are clearly exceptions to this rule. Yep. Um, and, that, and that is a weakness in Japanese companies. And there's a lot of rhetoric spoken now. Japan, you know, hasn't got its, you know, Facebooks and, you know, Teslas and, and, and all the other areas where you get people who go out and change the world. And uh, Japan had such a lead in, you know, post Second World War, 1960s, 1970s, but they throw so, threw so much of that away. And if you can blend the entrepreneurship and, and, and some of the basic management disciplines, fiscal disciplines included, you know, some of some Japan's companies could be outstandingly successful, although hostile takeover uh, is, is, again, another forbidden in Japan. It's interesting that that's the... Uh... I guess the expression that you used to describe a lot of Japan. My time in China, I thought that 
multiple times every day. The nail that sticks up gets hammered down as an explanation for a lot of the dysfunction that I saw in all kinds of settings there in China. I mean, they're both high power distance cultures, and I think that's inherently one of the, you know, probably the root cause of that being the case. It is. And, 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 and that's also one of the reasons why, you know, personally, I think there's, there's many more Olympuses out there. It's so much harder to get fraud exposed in Japan. You understand Japan. You've spent time there. You've, you've worked at it. You know, but so many Western investors are so splendidly ignorant of the sort of societal behaviors of Japan, which lead to some of the, the situations we've had. But getting, the, getting it out is so difficult. Getting those stories out is so difficult. Okay, so at that point, you hadn't had perspective, first-hand perspective from a foreigner, a gaijin running a Japanese company about what it's like to be a foreigner running a Japanese company. I had spent so much time in Japan. What I would never have guessed was, you know, how utterly spineless and subservient the board of, of directors was. I just would never believe it, that they would follow Kikukawa despite, you know, the, the company's own president, uh, you know, the president of the company, the CEO president saying we need to bring in forensic accountants. They would all, like lemmings, follow him. And, and even when it blew up and became public, they continued to do that. And that side, that, that I, I, I knew Japan was an obedient, uh, age-based you know, system, but not to that degree. So then it must have been Kikukawa-san's decision alone to make you, to promote you to president, COO, and CEO. Why did he pick you now that, you know... Good question. Given, yeah, given everything you know now, why you? He, because he knew I would have delivered the results and um, he would have been seen as um, a great innovator uh, choosing this guy, Jing. Uh, and I would do my four years and uh, as president and then, you know, I'd go back and uh, maybe eight years and then he would appoint, the executive he would have appointed would be Mori San, who was the sort of chief financial officer equivalent. But he, he, he was very unlucky because it, this scandal only came out because somebody, a whistleblower, who, who I've grown to know and like and respect, but at that time I obviously didn't know who they were, went to a small magazine called Factor. Factor published it on, online, and even you could buy Factor in the bookstore, newspaper store, outside Olympus's corporate headquarters. But none of the mainline media would pick it up. It's extraordinary that somebody actually went to Factor. That's just a freak in itself. And he was very unlucky that I, I was there to amplify what the allegations which had been reported in Factor. So he was very unlucky. Otherwise, his plan would have been perfect. The Olympus would have become more and more profitable. This, you know, 1.7 billion US dollars would have been a relatively small sum for the, the earnings capacity of a corporation like Olympus with its near around 50,000 employees at that time. It would have been lost in history and it would never have come out and we wouldn't be sitting here now having this conversation. Right. So you were so you you first became president and COO, and then about six months later you were named CEO. That's right. And, and I think you were what CEO for two weeks before you came across the FACTA article. No, no, I I, I became president on the first of April two thousand eleven. Before that, I was president elect. It followed also just a, a few days um, from the horrible northeast. Uh, earthquake in Tohoku, to Tohoku, where the tsunami had come through and um, destabilized the, the nuclear plant at Fukushima. There was a surprise that I went back. Uh, other f heads of foreign businesses weren't in the country, but I went back to assume the role. And they were the most special days of my working life because I saw the very best of Japan, where the collective came together and we were literally night and day, we weren't worried about money or profits. It was just to make sure that we could still provide service and infrastructure support for all these clinicians using our safety critical life-saving equipment. We had those weeks. Uh, in June, the Factor article came out and that's where my, my whole world changed. The Factor came out with these 
shocking allegations that Olympus had been doing these weird and wonderful things using huge amounts of money. I mean, Olympus made around 500 million US dollars at that time profits, tiny sum, lousy return for business like that. And $1.7 billion were involved in this fraud, you know, four years of the profits of the corporation. I had that honeymoon, those, that special time. And in June, it became my, when I read the allegations, I didn't believe them. They just seemed fanciful. But when I started to probe and, and question my colleagues, including Kikukawa, you know, I knew there was something rotten at the top of this corporation of which I was the president. And so then what, what happened? And it seems like there was kind of a slow burn then for a few months, right? I, I was in Hamburg chairing the European board meeting when I got an email telling me about this back to article. I was going back to Tokyo um, the following weekend and I, I got there and the first appointment was on a Monday morning. You know, I was jet lagged, but it was with mon a Monday morning with Kikukawa visiting one of Japan's largest electrical stores. I remember the meeting. He was very dominant, overbearing. Um, the founder of this company, who I liked a lot because he, he shared my views on inherited wealth and giving away what you've made in life. But he, at the end of the meeting, as is traditional in Japan, he got out four tickets for a big baseball game in Tokyo and gave two to Kikukawa-san and two to me. At the end of this meeting, Kikukawa thanked thanked. Um, and it was all in Japanese, though everyone spoke English. He thanked the owner in Japanese, then switched to English to say he took my tickets out of my hand, took them out of my hand, put them in, in his inside coat pocket and said, Michael's a Brit. He likes football. He doesn't like baseball. I thought, gosh, this man really has lost touch with you know, how you should behave. You know? um, but I thought he would then say, let's go for tea and I'll tell you about this article. But he didn't mention it. He left in his limousine, his Lexus, and I left in mine. I then phoned up my secretary and said, I have to meet, I have to meet with uh, Chairman Kikukawa. Um, and she said, oh, Michael, you, you mean you'd like to meet at his convenience? And the, my secretary, Machiko, was lovely, but it was one of the, I regret it, but I was, I was so worried. I, I said, no, Machiko, I must meet with him today. Please just do that for me. And I saw that in the car ahead, Kikukawa was the back of his head. I was following his car on this 40 minute journey back through rush hour Tokyo. And I saw his head and I could see he was animated, obviously getting the call that I wanted to see him that day. Michiko phones back and I could tell by her voice, he was so flat, not because I'd been curt or harsh with her, but because she thought I'd hurt myself. And she said, I've spoken to Mr. Kikukawa's secretary and because you're so insistent, he will meet you this afternoon uh, for lunch. That's the only time with Mr. Mori in a meeting room in the, in the head office. And I, I could feel that, you know, this is such a lovely woman, but she thought what I had done was deeply unhelpful for my own career in Olympus. Anyway, when I get to the office, I go for the meeting. I go in and at the big long board table and in the center is Kikukawa and on his right, um, Chief Financial Officer Mori, and Kikukawa was smiling away. And in front, I look on the table and there's a platter of sushi and it's got a little flag, which meant, I knew meant it came from the best, the best sushi uh, supplier in the fish market in Tokyo. I love sushi, everyone knows, knew it, uh, Olympus, I love sushi. But in front of my seat was a tuna sandwich and it still had the cling film and no side garnish of salad. And I, I, I was taken back by the, 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 the message for me was that Kikukawa is the luxury sushi platter and I'm the manky tuna sandwich and that's my place and not to forget it. I, I, I didn't touch the, the tuna sandwich and, and, and no one touched the sushi because I got out the Factor magazine, the hard copy, and I showed it to Kikukawa. And this, fact, this magazine was saying detailed allegations that you know, the company had bought three Mickey Mouse businesses for a billion dollars, not listed, no mark to mark price, hardly any turnover. You know, a, a food dish company, you know, a food dish, a face cream company. I mean, just crazy. And I said to Kiko Kawasan, is it true? And to my shock, he said, some of it. 
<laughs> and and that's where it all started. And, and I got more and more agitated. And I said, you know, I know you're very busy, but can I meet with Morrison and go through this? Uh, go through these allegations. And I was the president, and he could, and, and Morrison, in effect, worked for me, so he couldn't say no, but he got very agitated and his, his, his eyebrows started to flicker. And you know, you, you, know, you know everything immediately. I don't know if you've ever had one of those situations, but I knew there and then this company was terribly, something terrible and bad was going on within that board. You know, the relationship broke down, as I, as I started to write formal letters to him and a series of letters, he tried to tell me, you know, it's not helpful to write these letters. I was told an independent committee had already looked at these issues. If you ever heard the term independent committee in Japan, take it for what it's worth, which is very little. And my life spiraled out of control from there onwards. And I suddenly found myself in a sort of John Grisham novel where I was the protagonist. 